क्या हो गया हेलो फ्रेंड्स वेलकम वेलकम टू अनदर सेशन ऑफ बायो केमिस्ट्री सो कंटिन्यूंग फ्रॉम वेयर वी लेफ्ट येस्टरडे वी हैड कंप्लीटेड अवर डिस्कशन ऑन मोस्ट ऑफ द मेटाबॉलिजम्स वी हैड टॉक्ट अबाउट द ट्रांसपोर्ट वी टॉक अबाउट द फेड फास्टिंग स्टेट now we are left with two very small minor topics we are left with uh, the galactose and uh, the fructose metabolism and then we move on uh, to the topic of enzymes let us quickly uh, take a look at the two metabolic pathways one for uh, fructose and the other one for galactose we are starting off with these two metabolic pathways just give me a hi uh, to show me that you are present so that i know that uh, you are able to see this send me your uh, attendance uh, a thumbs up or a hi would do please let me know that you are here great i hope the audio is clear i hope the video is clear i hope you can hear me clearly those of you not using a headset or a earphone set i would request you to kindly arrange a headphone set or a earphone set to get uh, the good uh, audio quality and just using the speakers from the laptop or the mobile is not very effective for uh, the classes so it is best if you have a set of headphones if not then a pair of earphones will also do Obvious, obviously it is advised to use a pair of headphones so uh, i hope the voice is clear to everyone you can hear me clearly okay so today we are starting first with the fructose metabolism first we are starting with the fructose metabolism and from there we'll go on to the galactose metabolism fructose is uh, uh, one of the three important hexoses that we should know about the glucose galactose and the fructose slight difference from the metabolism of uh, glucose we'll see what are the important differences the fructose is quickly converted the fructose is uh, quickly converted into fructose 1 phosphate by the enzyme fructokinase recall when we said we have the kinase this means atp will be involved in transfer of phosphate and magnesium is required same thing is happening here also the fructose converted to fructose 1 phosphate by the action of fructokinase and immediately it is split into two immediately it is split into two by the action of aldolase b please note very specifically i am mentioning it is the aldolase b aldolase a does not act on fructose and phosphate it is the aldolase b which splits the fructose and phosphate into dihydroxy acetone phosphate and glyceraldehyde the second one is not phosphorylated the glyceraldehyde is not phosphorylated only the dihydroxy acetone phosphate is having the phosphate group because please note here we only have one phosphate we don't have two phosphate like fructose 16 bisphosphate so only one phosphate available which goes to the dhap dhap very commonly goes towards esterification it goes towards esterification however it can also participate in glycolysis it can participate in glycolysis right or it can combine with the modified glyceraldehyde whereby it becomes the glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate and together 
they can go towards the gluconeogenesis towards synthesis of glucose they can go towards synthesis of glucose again more commonly the glyceraldehyde will go towards esterification more commonly it will go towards esterification so please note the tendency of the metabolites of fructose is to go towards esterification tendency of the metabolites of fructose is to go towards esterification meaning lipogenesis meaning lipogenesis okay now few very important points to keep in mind here in some individuals the enzyme fructokinase is absent if enzyme fructokinase is absent the fructose will not be metabolized fructose level will uh, stay elevated in the blood but it doesn't present any signs and symptoms this condition is known as essential fructosuria now what you have to understand here fructose level elevated in the blood it will get filtered in the kidney but we had said fructose cannot be reabsorbed from the kidney so it will be excreted in the urine the condition is called essential fructosuria in some individuals allylase b is absent allylase b when it is absent fructose one phosphate cannot be metabolized further the condition is known as hereditary fructose intolerance in this condition there are uh, signs and symptoms of the cns neurological signs and symptoms are there there will be vomiting lethargy poor feeding all of these signs and symptoms will be there in hereditary fructose intolerance so two enzyme deficiencies can be there giving rise to the essential fructosuria and the hereditary fructose intolerance i quickly mention the important points about both first essential fructosuria essential essential fructosuria it is asymptomatic asymptomatic the fructose will appear in urine fructose will appear in urine and this fructose will give a positive benedict's test benedict test is the general test for all reducing sugars so it will give a positive benedict test in some individuals we want to be very sure what is this reducing substance so you can go for confirming whether it is glucose or something else so in that case we do the test called glucose oxidase test which is specific for glucose obviously this is not glucose this is fructose so this test will come out to be negative remember in essential fructosuria urinary examination will give us a positive benedict test and a negative glucose oxidase test other sinus symptoms are not there lastly you can have early onset diabetes like cataract the procedure is same as in diabetes via the sorbitol pathway via the sorbitol or the polyol pathway the excess fructose gets converted to sorbitol which will get deposited in the lens it will absorb the water and it will cause the cataract early onset diabetes like cataract by the age of 12 to 15 years will be seen everything else is normal everything else is normal so even if you identify a patient of essential fructosuria which is a diagnosis of uh, uh, you can say coincidence in that case also you have to ask the patient to avoid consuming the fructose because he is going to have the early onset diabetes uh, like cataract second hereditary fructose intolerance hereditary fructose intolerance now you have to remember in the newborn in the newborn we suggest what do you suggest exclusive 
breast feeding exclusive breast feeding and when the child is taking the breast milk there the sugar uh, the carbohydrate will be lactose lactose made of glucose and galactose so for the first 6 months there are no signs and symptoms meaning signs and symptoms appear at age greater than 6 months meaning after starting the top feed typically in the top feed we add the juices fruits fruit juice fruit pulp solid fruit in that case we will have lot amount of fructose in the fruits and then the sign of symptom will appear these patients will come to emergency these patients will come to emergency with neurological signs and symptoms with neurological signs and symptoms what are those signs and symptoms typically we find vomiting poor feeding you may find lethargy another term used is decreased responsiveness so these are the findings that you will see these are the findings that you will see present emergency with neurological signs symptoms vomiting uh, poor feeding lethargy decreased responsiveness is there when you do the biochemical examination of urine similar result as in the essential fructose urea what do you mean by that you will have a positive benedict's test and the negative glucose oxidase test last just like in the essential fructose urea you will have early onset diabetes like cataract management for these patients is very very simple management is very straightforward and simple and that is dietary restriction of fructose dietary restriction of fructose so you have to keep that in mind the dietary restriction of fructose is the very simple and straightforward management for these patients so this is about the defects in the fructose metabolism one is the essential fructose urea asymptomatic second is the hereditary fructose intolerance which is becoming symptomatic when you add the fruits to the diet of the children typically after 6 months and the biochemical examination of both will be same but you can see the clinical picture is drastically different that is about the fructose any question from fructose metabolism anything you want to ask from the fructose metabolism because now we are moving on to galactose we are moving on to galactose if you have any doubts or questions from fructose metabolism just punch them in okay so let's start with the galactose metabolism galactose metabolism galactose metabolism is also straightforward and simple galactose just like fructose acted upon by the galactokinase and because we have the kinase atp will be consumed and magnesium is required resulting in formation of the galactose 1 phosphate galactose 1 phosphate the galactose 1 phosphate is now combining with utp it combines with utp the enzyme catalyzing the reaction is galactose 1 phosphate uridyl transferase 
the more common name is just the uridyl transferase the more common name is just the uridyl transferase okay so uridyl transferase it will give us the udp galactose it will give us the udp galactose and the udp galactose can be reversibly converted into the udp glucose by the enzyme epimerase so these are the three reactions three reactions unique to the metabolism of galactose three reactions unique to the metabolism of galactose from here several things can happen the udp galactose can go to the formation of lactose it can participate in the synthesis of glycose amino glycans it can participate in the synthesis of glycoproteins it can participate in the synthesis of uh, glycolipids the gags can give rise to the proteoglycans right the udp galactose can participate in synthesis of lactose gags glycoprotein and glycolipids the same is true for udp glucose also the same is true for udp glucose also alternatively the udp glucose can release the glucose the glucose may be released which can then be metabolized accordingly which can then be metabolized accordingly so these are the three enzymes unique for the galactose metabolism again in certain individuals any of the three enzymes may be missing unlike fructose metabolism if any of the enzyme is missing the condition is known as galactosemia if any of the enzyme is missing the condition is known as galactosemia we don't have different names for the deficiency of different enzymes so condition is known as galactosemia it will present within first week of life it will present in first week of life why because the mother's milk contain lactose if you break down the lactose you get the glucose and galactose so in the milk only we have the galactose and therefore the sign symptoms will appear in the first week sign and symptoms are similar they will come to emergency with again the neurological sign symptoms just like we had mentioned previously in the hereditary fructose intolerance they will come with neurological signs and symptoms what are they vomiting poor feeding lethargy decreased responsiveness all right so similar neurological uh, findings are there but please note the age of presentation these children will present in the first week of life whereas in hfi the children were presenting after 6 months when you add the fruit to their diet then they were coming to you if you do a proper detailed examination you are also likely to find oil drop cataract you are likely to find the oil drop cataract oil drop cataract is due to the compound galactitol just like we get sorbitol from glucose and fructose from galactose we get the galactitol oil drop cataract that is galactitol these type of cataracts are also known as metabolic cataracts in ophthalmology we'll talk about the metabolic cataracts so it is a type of metabolic cataract it may present at birth or may appear by one year of age but in most patients by one year of age you will find this oil drop cataract by the age of one year in almost all patients you will find the oil drop cataract all right now if you do the biochemical examination of urine biochemical examination of urine surprisingly or rather not surprisingly you find the same signs and symptoms or same result the positive benedict's test the positive benedict's test and the negative glucose 
oxidase test so you note in all the three conditions we have the similar result positive benedict test and negative glucose oxidase test for hfi also positive benedict test and negative glucose oxidase test for essential factors urea also the positive benedict test and negative glucose oxidase test for the galactosemia also for galactosemia also so please note for all the three conditions the biochemical urinary result is the same but what is the difference difference is in the clinical presentation in galactosemia present at birth in hetero fructose intolerance present after 6 months in essential fructose urea there are no signs and symptoms the diagnosis is incidental okay please note deficiency of any of the three enzymes is called galactosemia but most commonly the deficiency is for the uridyl transferase the most commonly deficient enzyme in galactosemia is the uridyl transferase and just like the hfi the management is straight forward and that is dietary restriction it is the dietary restriction of the galactose so for these children we have a uh, special we have a special uh, uh, formulations where the galactose is not there we have special formulations uh, formula milk uh, is there which does not contain galactose so you have to give the complete diet restriction of galactose in these patients for them to improve they will be improve improve dramatically as soon as you remove the breast milk or the normal milk they will improve dramatically at this point i would like to mention one more condition which you may see in children of less than 1 year and that is neonatal diabetes mellitus what do you remember neonatal diabetes mellitus these children will present before 6 months classical features of dm will be there classical features of dm means frequent feeds see here we don't have polydipsia polyphagia because the child whether uh, the child is hungry or thirsty it will start crying so frequent feeds are uh, required and diapers will very fast it is denoting the polyuria it is denoting the polyuria what you have to remember here the neonatal diabetes mellitus is monogenic meaning a specific type of gene defect is there and therefore it is classified as the type 3 diabetes mellitus type 3 diabetes mellitus monogenic diabetes mellitus this is there and in the biochemical examination of urine obviously the benedict test will be positive the positive benedict test will be there but because it is diabetes mellitus the glucose will be coming in the urine we also find the positive glucose oxidase test we also find the positive glucose oxidase test so in this way it is slightly different from the other disorders of uh, monosaccharides there the positive benedict test was there but negative glucose oxidase test was there here the positive benedict test with positive glucose oxidase test because what we are getting in the urine is the glucose what we are getting in the urine is the glucose okay so that is all about uh, the uh, metabolism of the different metabolism for the uh, galactose and the fructose you should also know a little bit about the neonatal diabetes mellitus let's quickly take a look at some of the questions which vitamin is required for glycogen phosphorylase which vitamin is required for glycogen phosphorylase b1 b1 is as you know uh, thiamine b2 is riboflavin 
B3 is near sin and B6 is pyridoxin. The answer is D. In the form of pyridoxal phosphate, it is a phosphate donor for the glycogen phosphorylase. It is a phosphate donor for the glycogen uh, phosphorylase. Okay. Okay. In uh, the neutral diabetes mellitus, different types of gene defects may be there. There is not one specific gene which is involved, so there is no point in mentioning. There is a large uh, list of genes which may be defective in the neonatal diabetes mellitus. All right, so you don't need to know the gene. Large number of genes are there. If you are if you want to know the genes, then you should refer to the uh, classification table of diabetes in uh, the Harrison. It uh, lists a very large number of genes which may be defective in the children, resulting in the neonatal diabetes mellitus. Another classification of type 3 DM in uh, the Harrison a large number of genes are mentioned but there is no one specific gene which may be defective large number of genes may be deficient about the uronic acid we don't need to go into the detail of the pathway only thing you need to know what exactly is uronic acid we had briefly mentioned in the glycosaminoglycan they are the oxidized monosaccharides beyond that you don't need to know the details they are generally not asked okay Let's move on to next question. Very good. The answer is B6, that is pyridoxin. We had done this question. Rapid source of energy for exercising muscle after first minute. See, this question has been asked in multiple ways. What is the first source of energy for exercising muscle? What is the rapid source of energy for exercising muscle after uh, first minute? Another question can be first source first source so question can be first source or the question can be first source of ATP these are two different questions these are two different questions and the answer for each of them is different see the answer for the given question rapid source of energy for exercising muscle after first minute if you look at the table that we had drawn yesterday with glycogen metabolism the answer should be glycogenolysis the first source of energy we had said was the stored ATP. The first source of ATP is the stored phosphocreatine. So you have to look at the statement of the question and then you have to give the answer accordingly. Look at the statement of the question and give the answer accordingly. The answer in this case will be glycogenolysis. Rapid source of energy for exercising muscle after first minute. Why? Because the phosphocreatine gets exhausted in 20 to 30 seconds blood glucose will come after 2 to 5 minutes when the vasodilatation will occur only then it will come stored ATP is used up in 3 to 5 seconds the glycogenolysis is what is happening before vasodilatation this is what is happening before the vasodilatation the correct answer is glycogenolysis very good. The correct answer is glycogenolysis. Identify in the correct regulatory molecule. I had shown you in this diagram. It is a part of the glycogen metabolism where we had said the different uh, hormones are acting are on the cyclic AMP and thereby they are regulating the glycogen metabolism synthesis as well as breakdown. So here a is insulin and B is glucagon oblique epinephrine. Correct answer is D. Correct answer is D. Okay, A is insulin and B is glucagon. See what is happening here. A is activating the glycogen synthase. So that's insulin. A is inhibiting the glycogen phosphorylase. From here only you can say that A should be insulin. And it is given only in one option. That is option number D. This is uh, an information which you should know. 
रेज स्टैंड्स फॉर रिसेप्टर ऑफ एडवांस्ड वेरी गुड आई कैन सी लॉट ऑफ यू हैव गिवन द करेक्ट आंसर एडवांस्ड ग्लाइकेशन एंड प्रोडक्ट्स lot of research has been carried out in the rage in the last few years uh, where we have also studied the different polymorphism in uh, the rage gene and uh, the conclusion is the receptor which ad, uh, interacts with the advanced glycation product plays a very important role in diabetic complications the severity of the complications depend on the polymorphism of rage this means all of the above are correct all of the above are correct so please note down these points rage is a new topic lot of research going on and now we are expecting some drugs also which act on the rage to modify the complications in the diabetic patient they will not control the diabetes but they will modify the complications in the diabetic patients so you should know that rage is the target for a new class of drugs to modify the diabetic complications clinical case let's see how many of you can give me the answer i'll quickly read it out a 10 year old boy presents to emergency with a fainting episode during playing football so important thing is fainting episode blood examination reveals hypoglycemia raised level of ketone body lactic acid and triglycerides on examination liver and kidney were enlarged histopathology of liver shows excess deposit of normally formed glycogen so what are the highlights here the hypoglycemia is there the organomegaly is there features of uh, chronic hypoglycemia meaning elevated ketone body elevated triglyceride features of chronic hypoglycemia are there along with that we find the characteristic feature fainting episode and uh, the enlargement of liver and kidney these indicate that what is the answer these indicate what is the answer the answer what is the answer in this case the answer in this case is obviously the von gerke's disease the gsd type 1 the gsd type 1 the von gerke's disease is the correct answer lots of clinical case lots of clinical case will come from the glycogen storage disorder so you should be very very clear about the glycogen storage disorder we had spent some time yesterday to ensure you are comfortable in handling the case questions related to the glycogen storage disorder i'm so happy to see that most of you have given the correct answer the correct answer is option a another clinical case the exclusively breastfed see the point is exclusively breastfed neonate presents to emergency in the 7th month of life after we start the top feeding then the child is presenting with complaints of vomiting lethargy and poor feeding the resident on duty suspects inborn error of metabolism very correct the urine examination was negative by glucose oxidase negative by glucose oxidase but positive in the bendick test for reducing substance what is the most likely inborn error of metabolism i'll again highlight which are the important points to keep in mind age of presentation 7th month age of presentation 7th months neurological signs symptoms vomiting lethargy poor feeding urine examination is negative for glucose oxidase test but positive in the bendick test so as per this it cannot be the diabetes mellitus here we will have the positive glucose oxidase test it cannot be galactosemia because the age of presentation is 7th month it cannot be essential fructosuria because there are no signs and symptoms in essential fructosuria so the correct answer in this case is very good d hereditary fructose intolerance the correct answer is the hereditary fructose intolerance so nice to see everyone giving in the correct answers very good so that concludes our discussion on the uh, carbohydrates if you have any questions you can ask me i'll just uh, mention one point here 
there are several minor metabolic pathways which are there in the capillary metabolism but you need not go into the details of those they are not asked only few points that were required was sorbitol is involved in diabetes the uronic acid are involved in galactose uh, gl uh, gl glycose aminoglycans and that is all other information not required like i said on day 1 we have limited capacity here we have limited time so we should focus on the topics which are commonly asked in the exam because our syllabus is unending there is always something more to know but we cannot just chase after all the information we have to pick and choose what we want to do okay if you have any questions any doubts from the carbohydrate metabolism i'll give you 2 minutes else we'll move on to the electron transport chain if you have any doubts or questions please feel free to ask them otherwise we'll move on to the electron transport chain for rage the points that i have mentioned in the question only those things are required an additional point that you need to remember is rage is a potential target for modifying the diabetes complications it is a potential target to modify the complications as seen in the diabetes otherwise it is a receptor it binds to the advanced glycation product and it is responsible to determine the severity of complications that is all all these three points we had mentioned in the question anything else Ray stands for receptor for advanced glycation end products. In short, we write it as age. Age is obtained by the uh, glycation of uh, proteins. Age is obtained by glycation of uh, proteins. uh so uh, the there previously it was not known that we have receptors for these ages it is a recent discovery about 8 to 10 years back these receptors have been identified which combine with the advanced glycation product and they are responsible for they are responsible for complications of diabetes the anaplyotic reaction i'll show once we complete uh, the uh, amino acids once we have done the classification of amino acids at that point i'll show you the anaplyotic reaction which different amino acid are entering the uh, tca cycle at what point and which of them can be called the anaplyotic reaction which of them cannot be called the anaplyotic reaction that i'll do when we are doing the amino acids so don't worry about that any other question amphibolic means a pathway which is both catabolic and anabolic a pathway which is both catabolic and anabolic so catabolic is degradation of 
एसिटाइल को एनाबोलिक द इंटरमीडिएट्स कैन बी डायरेक्टेड टूवर्ड्स सिंथेसिस ऑफ अमाइनो एसिड्स वेन देर इज एक्सेस ग्लूकोज द इंटरमीडिएट्स कैन बी डायरेक्टेड टूवर्ड्स सिंथेस ऑफ अमाइनो एसिड वेर एज सर्टन अमाउंट ऑफ द ग्लूकोज इज डीग्रेडेड सो इट इज द सेम पाथवे द सेम पाथवे इज कैटाबोलिक इन नेचर ऑल्सो एंड इट इज एनाबोलिक इन नेचर ऑल्सो दैट इज वाई वी यूज द टर्म वी यूज द टर्म एम्फीबोलिक इन नेचर the same pathway is both catabolic and anabolic the same pathway is both catabolic and anabolic degradation is also occurring the synthesis is also occurring any other question any other question if there are no more questions then we will move on to the electron transport chain if there are no more questions then we move on to the electron transport chain okay so etc stands for the electron transport chain what it does the electron transport chain reduces receives the reducing equivalent from the nadh and fadh2 those reducing equivalent are passed along the various components of etc and uh, this movement generates a gradient a proton gradient the proton gradient is uh, used to generate the atp the proton gradient is used to generate the atp so electron transport chain is first part of what we had mentioned previously the oxidative phosphorylation it is first part of the process that is oxidative phosphorylation the oxidation part is occurring in the etc the oxidation part is occurring in the etc we'll see phosphorylation occurs later by the f0 f1 particle so we need to know a little bit about the electron transport chain remember the electron transport chain is present in the mitochondria it is embedded in the inner mitochondrial membrane the components of etc are present in the mitochondria they are embedded in the inner mitochondrial membrane so we have total four complexes in the electron transport chain where the different components are arranged as per their uh, redox potential they are arranged as per their redox potential and the movement of the electron is unidirectional okay it cannot go back from where it comes in the past we have only memorized the number of the complex for example we call it complex 1 but now you also need to know the names so please note down these names of the complexes complex 1 2 3 and 4 complex 1 takes up nadh it is oxidized and it reduces the substance q so the name is nadhq oxidoreductase the q is also known as ubiquinone the q is also known as ubiquinone similarly the complex 2 gets the reducing equivalent from succinate where succinate is converted to fumarate and reduces the substance q so it is known as succinate q oxidoreductase it is known as the succinate q oxidoreductase the q will pass on the reducing equivalent to the complex 3 in the process it will get oxidized and the cytochrome c is reduced so the next name is q cytochrome c oxidoreductase ultimately cytochrome c will pass on the reducing equivalent to oxygen 
resulting in formation of water and the cytochrome c will get oxidized the name of the enzyme is cytochrome c oxidase the most frequently asked question is about the complex 4 which inhibitors are acting on complex 4 so you must remember the complex 4 is also known as the cytochrome c oxidase it is also known as the cytochrome c oxidase Very frequently, you will get the different components of the complexes and you will ask to identify which of the arrangements of the complexes is correct. Before we go to the complexes, I will re-emphasize the point that I men mentioned initially. The electrons will flow from complex 1 to complex 3. The electrons will flow from complex 2 to complex 3. They cannot go from complex 1 to complex 2. They cannot go from complex 2 to complex 1. They cannot go from complex 3 to complex 1. They cannot go from complex 3 to complex 2. Backward movement of the electrons in the ETC will not occur because the complexes are arranged as per their redox potential. There is a unidirectional movement. There is unidirectional movement. The electrons cannot go back from where they have come. From complex 3, it will go to complex 4 and from complex 4, it will go to the oxygen. The backward movement of electron will not occur. The backward movement of electron will not occur. If you understand this, then arranging the subunits in order becomes easy. For this, you should now just know what are the important components in complex 1, what are the com components in complex 2 and in complex 3 and complex 4. That is all. So, let's look at complex 1. Complex 1, the important component is the FMN. Important complex is the FMN. We had read this in 11th and 12th. Details will not be required at this moment now. Very briefly, it describes the ability of a compound to either receive or donate electrons. It is a, a gradation, it is the gradation or capability of a complex to either receive or donate electrons. This is the redox potential. Please note at your level, details are not required. Details are not required. We have done these details in 11th and 12th, but now it is not required. You just have to remember that it describes the ability to receive or donate electrons and we can grade the complexes as per this uh, potential. So in complex 1, the important uh, compound is the FMN. In complex 2, this happens to be FAD. In complex 2, this happens to be FAD. In complex 3, we have two of them, cytochrome B and cytochrome C1 cytochrome B and uh, cytochrome C1 in complex 3 cytochrome B and cytochrome C1 in complex 3 and in complex 4 we have heme A heme A3 in addition we also have <coughs> two atoms of copper in addition we also have two atoms of copper Here, I would like to mention two, three points. As I've already mentioned, the ETC is embedded in the inner mitochondrial membrane, but two components of ETC are mobile. Which are the mobile elements? of ETC which are the mobile elements of ETC we have only two mobile elements in ETC one is Q the other is cytochrome C everything else 
is embedded in the inner mitochondrial membrane everything else is embedded in the inner mitochondrial membrane except for q and cytochrome c everything else is embedded in the uh, inner mitochondrial membrane total 67 protein subunits in etc we have a total of 67 protein subunits and lastly complex 1 complex 3 and complex 4 each of them pumps 4 protons each of them pumps 4 protons from matrix into the intermembranous space from matrix into the intermembranous space you get the four proton you get the four proton here the story is slightly different out of four two are used up so you end up with two protons So when we start with NADH, NADH will provide the reticulant at complex 1. It is able to transport 10 protons in the intermembranous uh, space. If you start with FAD, FADH2, it will start at complex 2. Complex 2 is not pumping protons, but complex 3 and 4 are pumping protons. So you will be able to pump only 6 protons. You will be able to pump only 6 protons. So what will happen then? What will happen then? So we are pumping 10 protons. we are pumping 10 protons and for every atp for every atp the number of proton required is 4 so when you start from the nadh when you start from the nadh we have 4 plus 4 plus 4 uh, 2 10 protons so the amount of atp that you can synthesize is 2.5 the amount of ATP that you're able to synthesize is 2.5. But if you start from the FADH2, if you start from FADH2, you are able to pump, you are able to pump only 4 plus 2, 6 protons. In this case, we get only 1.5 ATP. So this is why the FADH2 is making 1.5 ATP and the NADH is making 2.5 ATP. Right. so this is the transport of protons this is the transport of protons by the electron transport chain which was the oxidation now what is happening lot of proton has accumulated in the intermembranous space lot of proton has accumulated in the intermembranous space and now we want to push this back to the matrix the channel used is the f0 f1 particle also known as the ATP synthase also known as the ATP synthase or sometimes known as complex 5 sometimes it is also known as the complex 5 the F0 F1 the ATP synthase or the complex 5 will move protons from the intermembrane space into the matrix via the subunit the c subunit of the f0 particle the c subunit of f0 particle will provide a channel for the movement of proton into the matrix this movement is translated into the rotational movement how how this is conversion is done I'm showing you a cross section of the C subunit. 
so what we'll find here the channel is not a straight channel it is slightly slanted the channel is not a straight channel it is slightly slanted so when the protons will travel here the protons will travel here what we can do we can distribute their movement along two axes we have read this in 11th and 12th vectors we have read this vectors along the x-axis and along the y-axis the movement along the y-axis pushes it forward and the proton will reach here but the movement along the x-axis will act on the walls it will act on the walls of uh, the channel and this is what we perceive as rotation this is transmitted into the rotation so what is happening the potential energy is converted into the kinetic energy the potential energy is converted into the kinetic energy so for every four proton for every four proton we get one atp for every four proton traveling through the f0 f1 particle we get one atp if you start with nadh you get 10 protons so how many atp do you get we get 10 protons upon 4 proton per atp so your answer is 2.5 atp if you start with fadh2 you get 6 protons so in this case the answer is 6 protons upon 4 protons per ATP and your answer is 1.5 ATP so this proton gradient will travel will be dissipated through the F0 F1 particle resulting in the synthesis of ATP the potential energy is converted into the kinetic energy because the channel is at a tilt the channel is at a tilt and therefore this happens now two points to note here number one we have what is known as ATP ADP translocus a channel protein this channel protein is known as ATP ADP translocase. So, what it does, it will take the ADP inside and it will bring the ATP outside. Whatever ATP is being synthesized will be brought outside and the ADP will be taken inside to participate in the synthetic process. To participate in the synthetic process it will go inside so ATP ADP translocase is an additional protein which is present in the channel which helps to uh, facilitate the action of the F0 F1 particle if sufficient ADP is not there you cannot synthesize the ATP it doesn't matter if the proton gradient is there or not if the substrate is not there how will you make the product second thing is the presence of another channel the presence of another channel this channel is normally closed we call this as the UCP normally the UCP channel is closed normally it is closed but it is a straight channel it is closed but it is a straight channel if this channel is open if this channel is open then obviously all the proton which has accumulated here rather than going through the f0 f1 particle it will prefer to travel through this it will prefer to travel through this and all the h plus will come here and you don't get any atp what do you get only heat you don't get any uh, ATP what you get is only heat and please note this is the physiological mechanism 
for heat generation in warm blooded animals physiological mechanism for heat generation in warm blooded animals meaning the ucp can be activated physiologically also what is happening here the oxidation is occurring but phosphorylation is not occurring the proton gradient has been established but pro uh, the atp is not being synthesized and therefore this is also an instance of uncoupling the ucp actually stands for uncoupling protein the ucp stands for uncoupling protein the molecules which activate will be known as uncouplers the molecules which activate will be known as the uncouplers so this is the uh, basic information about the atp synthesis by the f0 f1 particle also known as the complex 5 or the atp synthase particle complex 5 or the atp synthase particle at this point let us quickly take a look at the inhibitors of the different complexes that we have talked about till now the inhibitors of the different complexes of the electron transport chain here i'll repeat you must know the name of the complexes also the numbers are not enough you must know the name of the complexes also inhibitors of complex one please note them down Inhibitors of complex 1, the pericidin A, the amobarbital, the amytol, the rotenon, the secobarbital, the chlorpromazine, the guanethidine, and the demerol. Inhibitors of complex 2, inhibitors of complex 2 are malonate. Carboxyl TTF. If you don't remember this, then also it's okay. If you don't remember this, then also it's okay. What you should focus on the malonate and carboxyl. Again, not very important. What is very important is the fen formin as an inhibitor of complex 3. You should remember the fen formin is an inhibitor of complex 3. In addition, the metformin is also an inhibitor of complex 3. So if the question asks about what is known as A rare entity called metformin associated lactic acidosis is due to the answer is blockage of complex 3. The mala, the metformin associated lactic acidosis is due to the blockage of complex 3. So you must remember this one. Okay. However, the most important, by far, by far the most important is the list of inhibitors of complex 5. Sorry, complex 4. List of inhibitors of complex 4. Very, very, very important. And the most important being the cyanide and the carbon monoxide very frequently asked about 8 to 10 times they have been asked in the different exams so you must remember about the carbon monoxide and cyanide being the inhibitors of complex 4 the carbon monoxide and cyanide being inhibitors of complex 4 i'll give you some additional points also inhibitor of complex 5 particularly the f0 particle this question has already been asked the venturicidin also known as abomycin is a likely question i have written lq it is a likely question most likely to be asked in the exam subsequently these you need not remember inhibitor of f1 are not very important you need not remember the tentoxin and aflatoxin but we have one more inhibitor and that is the inhibitor of atp adp translocase and it inhibits the attractylocyte this question has been asked twice this question has been asked twice. The oligomycin question has also been asked multiple times. The inhibitor of F0, uh, sorry, ATP, ADP translocase has 
also been asked twice so you must remember this in the last slide i am going to show you the uncouplers uncouplers which are able to activate the ucps the uncoupler proteins the uncouplers may be exogenous all phenolic compounds anything ending with phenol anything ending with phenol is an uncoupler these two are very important but at the same time we have endogenous uncouplers also we have endogenous uncouplers also for example thermogenin all of you know about thermogenin it is active in the brown adipose tissue where it generates the heat this is generated by activating the ucp1 similarly in patients of thyrotoxicosis body temperature is elevated in patients of hypothyroidism the body temperature is decreased why because thyroxine is not there it is not able to activate the ucp3 and the body heat will not be there similarly in the fight and flight response you are arguing with someone and already your face is red you have not received a slap you have not received a slap it already your face is red why because norepinephrine epinephrine will activate the ucp3 and more and more heat will be generated leptin a minor action is activation of ucp3 deficiency of essential fatty acid also activates the ucp proteins and lastly the purine nucleotide is also able to act as uncouplers they are also able to act as uncouplers so remember these are some exogenous endogenous uncouplers exogenous uncouplers are generally non specific whereas you can see the endogenous ones are specific they are acting on one type of ucp and endogenous non specific uncoupler is bilirubin endogenous non specific uncoupler is bilirubin okay so this is about the electron transport chain in a very brief so what we'll do we'll take a short break here of 10 minutes 15 minutes and then we'll start with the enzymes we'll finish the enzymes by 8 o'clock and then we take a dinner break and then we have another session at 9 o'clock i'll be here for 5 10 minutes if you have any questions or doubts about uh, Uh, the carbohydrate metabolism that we discussed, or the oxidative potential that we discussed, the biological oxidation, the uncouplers, the electron transport chain, the complexes, the inhibitors. Please feel free to ask. I had seen one question. Uh, Redox potential, amphibolic, monogenic type three. Okay. Any questions? Any questions? Any part you want me to repeat? any question any part you want me to repeat if there are no questions we'll take a short break for 15 minutes and we'll restart at 5:45 we'll take a short break and we'll restart at 5:45 we'll be taking up the topic of enzymes at 5:45 please send me if you have any questions else we'll take a break and restart at 545